If you'll bear with me, uh, please. I, um, I included some material in the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism from historical Palestine itself, because I think this is critically important. First of all, it's a, it's a very poorly uh, 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 recognized history. Uh, you have to go to a whole series of varied sources to put it together into one place, as I attempted to do. But this is the plight of the vanquished Jews in their indigenous homeland under Islam. And this is their chronic situation. Uh, and I think it's, it really bears uh, 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 reflection. Um, so I'll just read to you some, uh, a few passages, uh, some, some of my own summaries, and then some eyewitness accounts. Um, perhaps the clearest outward manifestation of the inferiority and humiliation of the dhimmis were the prohibitions, again, so this is now not just applying to Jews, it's Jews and Christians, uh, the prohibitions regarding their dress codes and demands that distinguishing signs be placed on the entrances of dhimmi houses. During the Abbasid Caliphates, again, another one of these sort of wandering golden ages, during the Abbasid Caliphates of Harun al-Rashid, from 786 to 809, and al Mutawakil, 847 to 861, Jews and Christians were required to wear yellow. This is uh, a millennium before the Nazis. This is before anything the Vatican imposed, um, as patches attached to their garments or hats. Later, to differentiate further between Christians and Jews, the Christians were required to wear blue. In 850, consistent with Quranic verses associating them with Satan and hell, and there are numerous verses, um, al Mutawakil decreed that Jews and Christians attach wooden images of devils to the doors of their homes to distinguish them from the homes of Muslims. And of course, um, as Batyur points out, these kinds of, of actions led to, quote, a wave of religious persecution, forced conversions, and the elimination of churches and synagogues. Um, so moving forward uh, about uh, two centuries, uh, uh, Solomon ben Jerohim, the wise, who was a major uh, Karaite uh, exegete uh, who lived in mid-10th century uh, Jerusalem, uh, observed the following. What can you say about a people, the Muslims, who curse you when you greet them, and when you do not greet them, humiliate you and offend you? When you talk to them, they want you to differ with them so that you be, you, you be considered a sinner. I have learned that the Jews of Samarkand, now he's talking about outside of Palestine, in the region where they say God is one, people who hear it testify, testify that by saying so, they have become Muslims. Therefore, if they want to remain Jews, they can only resort to saying there are a thousand gods or ten or less or more. Then the Muslims say, you are indeed infidels, and will let them hold their religion. The calamities inflicted upon the Jews under Islam are countless. Moving ahead to... Uh, Isaac bin Samuel of Acre, who lived from 1270 to 1350, and he was one of the outstanding uh, Kabbalists of, of his time. Uh, and interestingly, he concluded, despite the persecutions under Christendom, that it was preferable for him to live under Christendom uh, in this period. And so he actually fled uh, after being imprisoned when Acre was, was taken from the Crusaders by the, by the Mamluks. Um, and here's what he says. They, the Muslims, strike upon the head of the children of Israel who dwell in their lands, and they thus extort money from them by force. For they say in their tongue, Mal al Yahudi Muba, it is lawful to take money of the Jews. For in the eyes of the Muslims, the children of Israel are as open to abuse as an unprotected field. In their law and statutes, they rule that the testimony of a Muslim, now this is not just for Jews, this is for Dhimmis in general, uh, is always to be believed against that of a Jew. For this reason, our rabbis of blessed memory have said, rather beneath the yoke of Edom, of Christendom, than that of Ishmael. So now we're, that's, that, that we're into the late, the end of the, the, the 13th century. Um, then I wanted to read to you, uh, moving ahead to 1700. This is, this is from a fascinating chronicle by uh, Gedalia of Shibiatsi, a, a Polish Jew who traveled to Jerusalem and wrote something called Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. Uh, and he, he wrote this to try and garner uh, money for, for, the, for the Jews who were suffering at this time. And please bear with me, it's an extended uh, but very poignant extract. And this is now, we're now almost a thousand years after the first extract that I read to you, uh, across the continuum, across different Muslim empires, different Muslim rulers. 
But, but listen to what he says. We Jews were obliged to give a large sum of money to the Muslim authorities in Jerusalem in order to be allowed to build a new synagogue. Although the old synagogue was small and we only wanted to enlarge it very slightly, it was forbidden under Islamic law to modify the least part. In addition to the expenses and bribes destined to win the favor of the Muslims, each male was obliged to pay an annual poll tax of two pieces of gold to the Sultan. The rich man was not obliged to give more, but the poor man could not give less. Every year, generally during the festival of the Passover, and, uh, and, and generally during the festival, uh, an official from Constantinople would arrive in Jerusalem. He who did not have the means to pay the tax was thrown into prison, and the Jewish community was obliged to redeem him, so collective punishment. The official remained in Jerusalem for about two months, and consequently, during that period, the poor people would hide wherever they could. This is copiously documented in the Geniza documentary record uh, by Goytain over, over centuries. But if ever they were caught, they would be redeemed by community funds. The official sent his soldiers throughout the streets to control the papers of the passers-by. For a certificate was provided to those who had already paid the tax. If anyone was found without his certificate, he had to present himself before the official with the required sum. Otherwise, he was imprisoned until such time as he could be redeemed. The Christians were also obliged to pay the poll tax. During the week, the, the, the paupers dared not show themselves outside. In their wickedness, the Muslim soldiers would go to the synagogues, waiting by the doors, requesting the certificate of payment from the congregants who emerged. No Jew or Christian is allowed to ride a horse, but a donkey is permitted, for in the eyes of Muslims, Christians and Jews are inferior beings. The Muslims do not allow any member of another faith, unless he converts to their religion, entry to the Temple Mount area, where they claim that no other religion is sufficiently pure to enter this holy spot, 1700. They never weary of claiming that although God had originally chosen the people of Israel, he had since abandoned them on account of their iniquities in order to choose the Muslims. So clear supersessionism. In the land of Israel, no member of any other religion besides Islam may wear the color green, even if it is a thread of cotton like that which we decorate our prayer shawls. If a Muslim perceives it, that could bring trouble. Similarly, it is not permitted to wear green, a green or white turban. On the Sabbath, however, we wear white turbans on the crown of which we place a piece of cloth of another, of another color as a distinguishing mark. The Christians are not allowed to wear a turban but they wear a hat instead, as is customary in Poland. Moreover, the Muslim world requires that each religious denomination wear its specific garment so that each people may be distinguished from another. This distinction also applies to footwear. Indeed, the Jews wear shoes of a dark blue color, whereas Christians wear red shoes. No one can use green, for this color is worn solely by Muslims. The latter are very hostile towards Jews and inflict upon them vexations in the streets of the city. The common folk persecute the Jews, for we are forbidden to defend ourselves against the Turks or the Arabs. This is the period of Ottoman rule. Um, if an Arab strikes a Jew, he, the Jew, must appease him, but dare not rebuke him for fear that he may be struck even harder, which they, the Arabs, do without the slightest scruple. This is the way the Oriental Jews, remember, this is a Polish Jew writing this, uh, react, for they are accustomed to this treatment. Whereas the European Jews, who are not yet accustomed to suffer being assaulted by the Arabs, insult them in return. Even the Christians are subjected to these vexations. If a Jew offends a Muslim, the latter strikes him a brutal blow with his shoe in order to demean him, without anyone's being able to prevent him from doing it. The Christians fall victim to the same treatment, and they suffer as much as the Jews, except that the former are very rich by reason of the subsidies that they receive from abroad. Then they use this money to bribe the Arabs. As for the Jews, they do not possess much money with which to oil the palms of the Muslims, and consequently, they are subject to much greater suffering. Now, to be fair, the Ottoman Empire, under tremendous pressure uh, and, and defeat uh, by the European powers, was forced to engage in what the Ottomans considered to be quote-unquote capitulations. But essentially, these were what turned out to be half-hearted and regardless unsuccessful attempts to reform some of these brutally discriminating aspects of the Sharia, the so-called Tanzimat reforms. Um, the first round was iterated around 1839, and there were later rounds, none of which were, were successful. Um, I'm going to read you another extract. This is from 1847, again in Palestine, by the Jewish travelogue writer J.J. Uh, Binyamin II. 
Deep misery, again, this is after the Tanzimat reforms were, were at least attempted. Deep misery and continual oppression are the right words to describe the condition of the children of Israel in the land of their fathers. They are entirely destitute of every legal protection and every means of safety. Instead of security afforded by law, which is unknown in these countries, they are completely under the orders of the sheikhs and pashas, men whose character and feelings inspire but little confidence from the beginning. It is only the European consuls who frequently take care of the oppressed and afford them some protection. With unheard of rapacity, tax upon tax is leveled on them, and with the exception of Jerusalem, the taxes demanded are arbitrary. Whole communities have been, in, been impoverished by the exorbitant claims of the sheikhs, who, under the most trifling pretenses and without being subject to any control, oppress the Jews with fresh burdens. In the strict sense of the word, the Jews are not even masters of their own property. They do not even venture to complain when they are robbed and plundered. Their lives are taken into as little consideration as their property, their lives. They are exposed to the caprice of anyone, even the smallest pretext, even a harmless discussion, a word dropped in conversation, is enough to cause bloody reprisals. Violence of every kind is, a da is of daily occurrence. When, for instance, in the contests of Muhammad Ali, so this was uh, in turn seen struggle within, within the Muslim empire, uh, with the sublime port, with the Ottomans, the city of Hebron was besieged by Egyptian troops and taken by storm. The Jews were murdered and plundered, and the survivors scarcely even allowed to remain, uh, retain, uh, retain a few rags to cover themselves. No pen can describe the despair of these unfortunates, and I have some uh, eyewitness accounts of this in the compendium. The women were treated with brutal cruelty, and even to this day many are found who since that time uh, are miserable cripples. With truth can the lamentations of Jeremiah be employed here. Since that great misfortune, up to the present day, the Jews of Hebron languish in the deepest misery, and the present sheikh is unwearied in the endeavors, not to allow their condition to be ameliorated, but on the contrary, he makes it worse. The chief evidence of their miserable condition, miserable condition is the universal poverty which we remarked in Palestine, and which is here truly astonishing, for nowhere else in our long journeys in Europe, Asia, and Africa, he traveled extensively, uh, did we observe it among the Jews. It even causes leprosy among the Jews of Palestine, as in former times. Robbed of their means of subsistence from the cultivation of the soil and the pursuit of trade, they exist upon the charity of their brethren in the faith in foreign parts. In a word, the state of the Jews in Palestine, physically and mentally, is an unbearable one. Now, given this kind of chronic persecution, it's not surprising then, I would think, uh, to see what happens in terms of, of full-fledged uh, pogroms. And so, what I'm going to just quickly summarize for you is, is a series across space and time uh, of, of, of mass murders, uh, uh, pogroms, violence committed against Jews in Islamdom uh, without getting into all the details about them. Maybe we can talk about this a little bit in the discussion. They, they were, they were uh, uh, the result of specific incitement, anti-Semitic motifs. Um, 6,000 Jews massacred in Fez in 1033. Hundreds of Jews slaughtered in Muslim Cordoba between 1010 and 1015. 4,000 Jews killed in Muslim riots in Grenada in 1066, wiping out the entire community. By the way, in this particular pogrom, uh, more Jews were killed in this one pogrom uh, than were killed in the ravages 30 years later uh, when the Crusaders set out uh, for, for Palestine and ravaged the Jewish communities of the Rhineland. This, this was a more, much more extensive massacre. The Berber Almohad depredations of Jews and Christians uh, in Spain and North Africa between 1130 and 1232, 1232, which killed tens of thousands while forcibly converting thousands more and subjecting the forced Jewish converts uh, to Islam to a Muslim inquisition. This is what Maimonides uh, wrote about. Uh, the 1291 pogroms in Baghdad and its environs, which killed at least hundreds of Jews. The 1465 pogrom against the Jews of Fez. The late 15th century pogrom against the Jews of the southern Moroccan oasis of Tuat. The 1679 pogroms against and then expulsion of 10,000 Jews from Sana, Yemen, to the unlivable, hot, and dry plain of Tihama from which only 1,000 returned alive in 1680, 90% having died from exposure. 
recurring Muslim anti-Jewish violence, including pogroms and forced conversions, throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, which rendered areas of Iran, for example, Tabriz, Judenrein. And that was the first time I had seen this word in a context outside of Europe. The 1834 pogrom in Safat, this was during the Muhammad Ali era, uh, where raging Muslim mobs killed and grievously wounded hundreds of Jews. The 1888 massacres of Jews in Isfahan and Shiraz, Iran. The 1910 pogrom in Shiraz. The pillage and destruction of the Casablanca, Morocco ghetto in 1907 the pillage of the ghetto of Fez, Morocco, in 1912. The government sanctioned, this is the Turkish government, sanctioned anti-Jewish pogroms by Muslims in Turkish Eastern Thrace during June, July, 1934, this is under Ataturk, which ethnically cleansed at least 3,000 Jews. And the series of pogroms, expropriations, and finally mass expulsions of some 900,000 Jews from Arab Muslim nations beginning in 1941 in Baghdad, the murderous Farhu, during which 600 Jews were murdered and at least 12,000 pillaged, eventually involving cities and towns in Egypt, Morocco, Libya, Syria, Aden, Bahrain, and culminating in 1967 in Tunisia that accompanied the planning and creation of a Jewish state, Israel, on a portion of the Jews' ancestral homeland. So, I, um, you know, this, this it, th this, this sort of hatred and its ugly consequences are hardwired. Um, and for whatever the reasons, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish intelligentsia uh, does not want to come to grips with this. And um, it's not going to go away by, by being ignored. And, it's, and, and, and certainly, that doesn't mean we should ignore all the other virulent anti-Semitism that exists. I did this almost as a lark, but it turned out to be very informative. Um, that that it, it confirmed, frankly, my worst fears and, and, and suspicions. That, um, uh, to be blunt about it, the Jewish intelligentsia doesn't have a clue, nor, nor does it seem to want to. And, 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 